Good evening. It's wonderful to be with you this evening. Again, my name is Kevin Brower. I serve as department chair of the Department of Music at Brigham Young University, Idaho. And in behalf of the university, the College of Performing and Visual Arts, and the Department of Music, it is my pleasure to welcome you and also welcome ourselves to be with you. It's great to be here and share this, uh, this evening with you. We traveled through a little bit of weather today to get here. And uh, we thought it was befitting of us coming from Rexburg to bring you a little gift. <laughs> I particularly invite you to uh, enjoy this evening of this presentation of God's Everlasting Love with music composed by Robert Kundick and text by Elder David A. Bednar. Before we get started, I want to recognize any past composers of the BYU-Idaho Sacred Music Series. If you are in the audience tonight, we'd invite you to stand and be recognized by the audience. It's wonderful to see good friends. Thank you for being with us. We also are pleased to announce the uh, commission of our next sacred music project that will be premiered in the summer months of 2012. Our next composer that has been selected uh, uh, through a committee and also or nominated by a committee and invited by our university president is K. Newell Daly will be composing our next commission. We look forward to that uh, experience and hope to be back with you in a few years uh, for the same experience. We're pleased to have Brother and Sister Kundik with us tonight, and family and friends. Thank you for in, uh, providing us this wonderful opportunity to share in such rich musical and spiritual uh, feast as you have provided for us tonight. This evening's presentation represents countless hours of preparation and dedication to a wonderful cause. There are nearly 300, in fact, more than 300 students seated behind me, uh, representing majors and studies from all across campus. Behind the scenes, of course, are even more hours of dedicated time and resources from the university, the college, and department. We deeply appreciate all that have given much to promote this kind of event, the creation of beauty and experiences of virtue. In one of his most recent General Relief Society addresses to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, President Dieter F. Uchtdorf stated, the desire to create is one of the deepest yearnings of the human soul. No matter our talents, education, background, or abilities, we each have an inherent wish to create something that did not exist before. Tonight, BYU-Idaho is pleased to present another in this ongoing series of newly created, significant sacred music composition. The purpose of this series is to allow those most appropriately prepared to create and share gospel messages through music. For many centuries, the form of oratorio has been used to provide a forum for deeper communication and learning of important gospel ideals. The combining of text with appropriate music allows the learner and the teacher to more fully experience the depth and breadth of key principles through thought and feeling. In addition to the learning element of the oratorio, appropriate music with text is also used to enhance the experience of a worship service. God's everlasting love offers a similar experience. Like the oratorio, it provides instruction, but it also follows the form of a worship service. While somewhat unusual for a concert setting, we invite all gathered to experience tonight's presentation as a time of sharing in this new creation and a time of worship through the art of music. The format of tonight's presentation will allow for audience members to appreciate this new work in a concert setting and a time for personal reflection. In this manner, we invite you to applaud at the beginning of the program as the conductor and soloists come to the podium. Following the initial applause, we invite you all to quietly listen as the orchestra begins the first part of the work entitled Prelude. Similar to a worship service, Prelude will be immediately followed by an invocation offered by Randall Kempton of the Department of Music faculty. The presentation will then continue uninterrupted as indicated in your program, with one exception. A benediction will be offered by Ida Ashby of the Department of Music faculty immediately following the last choral number. We invite, then the, the orchestra will conclude the presentation by playing postlude. We invite you to remain seated 
and hold your applause until after the benediction and the final number by the orchestra. Again, we appreciate, deeply appreciate all of you for being here with us this evening. President Thomas S. Monson has said, how grateful I am for those blessed with musical talents who are willing to share their talents with others. I am reminded of the scripture found in the Doctrine and Covenants. For my soul delighteth in the song of the heart. Yea, the song of the righteous is a prayer unto me, and it shall be answered with a prayer, with a blessing upon their heads.
when President Kim Clark called me and asked if I would do this commission, he took me by surprise, having been part of this series with an earlier composition, The Song of Nephi. I was not prepared for this invitation. I thought it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and now I find it this is twice-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I explained to President Clark that I was somewhat reticent to accept the commission because I had already composed what I felt was my most significant work entitled The Redeemer, scored for orchestra, solos, and uh, choir. Uh, this was performed initially by Brigham Young University and has received many performances since I composed it in the late 70s. I used a particular form for that work. I called it a, a service of sacred music. I constructed it so that it opened with an invocation and closed with a benediction, which was surrounded by a prelude and a postlude. It dealt with the uh, prophecies concerning the Savior's coming, his earthly ministry, and then his crucifixion and promise to return. I told President Clark that I was intimidated because that had been so successful and it, I felt it was my very, very best work. But the opportunity to compose something new for the wonderful students at Brigham Young University, Idaho, was an in intriguing opportunity. I decided when I proceeded that since the works previously in this series were based on the standard works, that I would do something different. And so with the permission of President Clark, I asked Elder David Bednar to provide a text, and I told him I'd like to use the same form that I had used in the Redeemer. And Elder Bednar graciously accepted my request and composed a wonderful text on the, the title which he himself provided, God's Everlasting Love. This has been a very fulfilling opportunity for me. When my son, who sings in the Tabernacle Choir, my oldest son, heard the work, he said, I was prepared for a letdown because of the beauty and significance of the Redeemer composition. But when he heard it, he said, Dad, I think that you have done as well as you did with that composition. I'm in no way feeling that it's inferior. And so I'm overjoyed, and especially with the wonderful musical forces at Brigham Young University, Idaho, with the 
superb chorus, the wonderful orchestra, and fine soloist, excellent soloist. And so this has been a very rewarding experience for me, above all because as a sacred service, it permits the musicians and the congregation to react individually to Elder Bednar's message. And this has happened invariably at each performance, which has been extremely gratifying for me. I was asked how I proceeded once I had the text and I said that I had invariably pondered, prayed, and then composed. And using that procedure, I feel that I have done my very best with this composition. And I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to work with this wonderful school this wonderful student body at Brigham Young University, Idaho. Uh, well, I just feel really blessed uh, to be involved in it. Uh, every time I've uh, been involved with one of these sacred music projects, I uh, come away with such a sense of uh, musical and spiritual enlargement. Uh, it's such a rewarding experience. I feel like the messages that we share through the text and music are so profound and uh, and important truths that, uh, that we have to share with the audiences. So every time we perform it and every time we uh, wrap up one of these projects, I just look back and think it, it was such a rewarding experience. This work obviously is uh, focused on uh, God's uh, great love that he has for each of his children. And I would just hope that when someone listens to this work, they feel that, they feel that love in their life, they feel an increase of that love and that they can then uh, share that with others. Uh, one of my favorite movements is the, uh, the one where the text uh, says, I, uh, I can burst these bands, uh, I, I can and I will. I love how it uh, talks about the um, rejection of the natural man and how we can choose to follow that, uh, that prompting of the Spirit and follow God's path. I like that. One of my favorite parts of the uh, oratorio is uh, uh, when the choir sings, a saint arises. Uh, shortly after I sing it as a, a solo, they have this uh, musical section where it builds and increases in uh, intensity and dynamic, and then there's this great big statement of a saint arises, and that is just a powerful moment. And again, that goes back to the, the uh, motive of that we can turn away from the natural man and become a saint through the atonement of Christ. This is actually the third project I've been involved in. Uh, initially, I was a choir member in the Emmanuel tour uh, that Robert or uh, Newell Daly wrote uh, back in, um, in the Ricks College days. And then after that, I was a soloist in uh, the uh, project written by Merrill Jensen, Come Unto Christ. And then uh, this, uh, this semester, we uh, were just looking at uh, options and possibilities of, of solos, and we got talking about uh, me as a possibility, and that's, that's sort of how I got involved, actually. It was uh, just in, in a faculty meeting. We thought, okay, let's look at the possibilities, and, well, you're, you're an option as well. So uh, I'm just counting all my blessings for having been uh, able to be involved. Well, it's uniquely LDS, I think, and, and both, the text is so much uh, LDS doctrine, and I mean, and it, it speaks so clearly to a member of the church, and that makes it unique a unique experience for me because I haven't been involved in any of the sacred music projects up to this point, and so for me, that's the the, the difference is that the, the the music in a way is very beautiful, and I think of different sections of it like this composer or that composer, but when you 
pair it with the text of Elder Bednar's, it, it becomes a new thing, and that's what for me is the difference, is that pairing of text, which is such a, uh, a unique and direct doctrinal uh, discussion, so, so pertinent to the LDS people. Conducting's a great um, mesh between the physical reaction to the music and the sound, and I try in my gesture to amplify the emotional context, context of the music, to try and bring out the words and the meaning of the words, and to try and encourage and, and, uh, and uh, intensify that experience for the musicians to, to encourage them to also um, communicate more with the audience as well. And so it's a very draining but exhilarating experience. I find that my heart's beating very fast and I, I feel a range of emotion even more heightened than I might if I were sitting and listening. Well, I think it changes them, just like the text says. Uh, I think that in a way they get to experience that becoming a little different. And, and as they hear the words multiple times and they hear ex experience the piece, I think it makes them better people. Well, I just think it's a tremendous uh, uh, honor to be involved with it. I mean, to, have, to set the words of an apostle with a full-length oratorio, which I think is a unique offering for our church, and Brother Kundik's done such a beautiful job with the score. It's such a lovely, accessible work, and, and the words are so doctrinally pure but beautiful in their, in their setting. I th it's just a privilege for me. I mean, I think that we'll find the doctrine in the scripture, and what Elder Bednar has done is very scriptural, but it's, it, it's an apostle's words, and so we can take it as, as modern scripture in many respects. I mean, I don't mean to, to step beyond what I should be saying there, but I, I think that it feels the same to me. Well, when I had a chance to sit down with Brother Kundik um, after the performances, he really didn't say a lot. Um, before, we talked about the, the tempos of the pieces and how fast he wanted them to go and how he wanted to change some of the original things in the music, but otherwise he just was uh, very grateful over the experience. And, and I, In fact, I think I wanted more from him, and in a way I appreciated it because I felt that it allowed us as performers the opportunity to put ourselves into the work more than we might have if he would have been more managing of, of all the elements. This, is a, this was a commissioned work for the Sacred Music Project, which has been a tradition at Ricks College and BYU-Idaho for, I think, believe the past 20 years. The Sacred Music series at BYU-Idaho has become a significant part of our department's offerings and what we hope to accomplish. Uh, this uh, God's Everlasting Love is our tenth in the series of a biennial commission in which we commission composers to uh, prepare and present uh, a significant musical work for choirs, soloists, orchestras, trying to include a lot of students so that they can enjoy the benefit of not only working on a new, newly created piece of art and music, but also to explore some of the doctrines of, uh, of the gospel and the, and the messages of the gospel. We've limited the composers to uh, the text of scripture, and in this one, in this case, the text of Elder David A. Bednar. And it's, it's, the significance of it really is to provide an opportunity for composers to share their musical talent in, in ways of communicating that uh, otherwise wouldn't be available to them because it's not a, it's not a commercial venture. Uh, they're not uh, trying to completely make a living by doing it, and yet we provide a way that they can, uh, we provide a, a bit of compensation so that they can focus their time on that without having to... Uh, pander necessarily to what is popular or something like that, but to really communicate what they feel and what their hearts tell them. Well, the immediate impact has been uh, the script or the text of a, of a living prophet and apostle, and uh, the, the kindness and, and generosity that Elder Bednar has shown our institution, not only as a past president of the university, but also in uh, being so generous with his time to produce this text. And the text in its uh, in, in its conception really is intended to be one of hope and to teach the students and those who will listen and or those who have an opportunity to listen to uh, really understand what God's love means. And so to the students, they've, they've immediately grab, grabbed on to the concept of, of the text by Elder Bednar. And then of course matched with appropriate music by Robert Kundick, it, it drives the message very deep into their hearts. Well, I've been involved in all ten. Now, I say ten. There was an, an original work by Darwin Wolford that was produced in 1988 as part of a centennial celebration for then Ricks College uh, that uh, sort of kick-started the idea. And so if we count his, it's really the eleventh one, but the part of this commission, the series we was begun, I've been involved in all ten 
uh, since its beginning with uh, Crawford Gates' Vision of Eternity. They all are very interesting. Each of them have their own uh, favorite uh, parts that uh, we could certainly talk about, but I don't necessarily have a favorite one. Uh, this one has been a joy, again, because it has branched away a little bit from uh, our, our requirement to have it be uh, scripture from the standard works and to be uh, the voice of a living apostle. The, uh, the music has been uh, wonderful. Brother Kundik has, uh, has worked with us before and really knows what he's writing. You know, he, he understands the group that he's writing for and how he's going to work with the instrumental and vocal forces. And so it's, he's understood quite well what we're dealing with and tried to create a work that was reasonable for us to perform and yet still provide a message. Uh, he knows the, the, really the spirits of these, these people and, and how they want to, uh, uh, their youthfulness and some of the things that they would, they would like to communicate themselves. So that's been a, a very endearing process. I am, I am amazed uh, in many ways that an 82-year-old man could write this, and yet I, it, would, it shouldn't surprise us that it really takes that kind of life. It takes that kind of depth and that kind of wisdom. It takes that kind of maturity to understand the true meaning of what music can do. Uh, certainly as, as a young composer or a, a budding artist uh, would, would, would be excited, enthusiastic, and be able to share much in their talent and their craft, that age shows a lot of, uh, or gives a, a person a great perspective to look out across the ages and decades. And so I, I'm amazed that he would have the time and the energy to do it, and yet I am not surprised that it is such a magnificent work because of that age and maturity. When we approached uh, Brother Kundik to uh, work on this, uh, his, he was very excited about it. He was the one that came to us with the concept of uh, breaking away from the standard works to using the words of a, of a living apostle. And as, as, we, as we've designed this, uh, we really wanted to teach the principles as recorded in the scriptures. And in the future, we may return to that and, and still honor that tradition. But he was very enthusiastic in trying to create a work that would feature uh, the living voice uh, of what might be here. And uh, with enthusiasm, uh, with his enthusiasm, we, we gave him permission to do that, and he made the contacts. And he was able to secure that through, uh, through Elder Bednar and be able to work on that, uh, probably something we wouldn't have been able to. So he was, he was really enthusiastic and, uh, from the outset and, in fact, created the work in record time. Uh, we typically give the composers two years to write the piece, uh, and that includes bringing together the text or organizing the text and creating the music, orchestrating it. Uh, Brother Kundik has been uh, done for about a year now, and he's <laughs> been very anxious to have this work performed. It's been a great blessing. The piece affects me in a way, both a holistic way and in a specific way. In a holistic way, again, the piece approaches God's love without trying to demonstrate the drama and the, the, the confusion that is also present when one is trying to think about where is God. But this text and this music simply records where God is and that he's, He is here. And so overall, it affects me in a very peaceful and calming way. There are specific moments, though, in which the peace stirs me to a rich emotional experience and a spiritual experience in knowing that our Heavenly Father is not only concerned about our welfare, but has made arrangements through the atonement of Jesus Christ for us to enjoy the comfort and peace of our Heavenly Father's love, and that we might not only wait for that as a future event, that we might have that everlasting love with us today. My feelings about this work can only be described through the words of the program, um, Everlasting Love. I believe that um, Elder Kundik and Elder Bednar were trying to help us to understand what God's love feels like. And um, I believe that all the performers and hopefully the audience members feel that through this music. I believe that Oftentimes we get caught up in life, in the little things, and um, my weeks can be filled with many activities. However, these past few weekends playing this music, I have felt an amazing peace in my life that 
is oftentimes missing. And the Spirit is there when we play, and I am so grateful for the opportunity to be reminded why I'm a musician. Well, much like a devotional or a fireside or a church meeting, I hope that the audience feels leaving, leaves feeling uplifted, um, edified, and filled with a desire to be better, as I do. The repetition in this, in this work, in this process, is necessary because I feel like at just at a previous rehearsal, I finally understood why I was playing it, and I've been playing it for weeks. And so I believe that the repetition is important for the performers. Um, just like in the gospel, we grow little by little, step by step, and each time we perform this work, I learn new things. Some of my feelings after performing this work are greater appreciation, most importantly, of our Savior Jesus Christ, of His atonement, His mission, the reason that, that He's here, His central role in the plan of salvation, and I think most importantly, the way that that affects me personally as a child of God, that through the atonement of Christ, I can be changed, that I can be cleansed and purified, that my weaknesses can become strong, and that I can be perfected and become like my Father in heaven. I hope that everyone that comes and listens becomes an active participant in that their testimony and understanding of the atonement increases so that when they leave tonight that they will go home with a greater peace and a hope of becoming better through the atonement of Jesus Christ. I feel that the process of change comes a little by little. And that's how that change has come in my life through participation in this oratorio. As I, I remember the first time I read the words and I felt the power of that. And now as I sing them, I remember specifically the first night we performed in the Heart Auditorium. As we sang Jesus once of humble birth, we spoke of Christ and his crucifixion and his hanging on the cross. But now he reigns as a king and a ruler. And in that moment, I recognized how pivotal Christ's role is for me and that his atonement was for me personally. And so I feel that that change has come every time that we perform. I feel a little closer to him and I recognize what he did for me 